Hello, my name is Martin Stevens, and I am the CEO of a company called It Is 3D. You can see on this slide some of the things which reflect what we do as a company, so uh, creative designs and uh, a 3D printer. Now, what our particular focus is, bringing 3D technologies into schools, and we do this for a number of reasons. Firstly, because this is 21st century technology, which is going to impact every child, no matter what career choice they make when they leave school, in some way 3D printing is going to impinge on their lives. Secondly, this is technology which really excites and motivates pupils. So if they are suitably motivated, this is a way of bringing them into interest in and excitement for STEM subjects, STEM being science, technology, engineering and maths. And if they do choose a career in which involves one of those particular areas, then not only will they be helping to solve a significant skills gap, but at the same time they will be uh, in a position to have a fabulous career for themselves. So why is uh, this important in schools uh, in greater detail and then I'll go on to explaining what 3D technologies will become during the 21st century and why it's so exciting and why it's going to become so important. There is a lot of talk and a lot of hype about 3D printers and that hype is to some extent justified in that 3D technologies and 3D printing are going to change the world. <coughs> in the context of the classroom, however, a 3D printer is, at the end of the day, a tool. It's a clever tool, and it's a buzzy, exciting tool, and it allows any child to create a 3D model, such as, for example, this one, uh, Sphinx, and show it to family and friends and say, I did this, and give them a great sense of satisfaction. But it's only useful if the pupil is able to create a design in the first place, a 3D design using computer technology, which they can then print. And if they can't design, then all they're doing really is just making something that somebody else has designed in the first place and there's not a great deal of learning in that. So the first point on the slide teaches creative skills. It allows pupils to exploit their creativity and their imaginations in order to design something. I will come back to the question of how they design and what they use to design. It teaches them technical engineer and engineering skills as I've said, this is uh, around STEM-based subjects, but it is not solely for STEM-based subjects. It does have a whole school relevance. And once I've explained a bit more about designing in 3D and making in 3D, I'll come back to this point of how it is relevant for the whole school and how that can be made to work within the educational environment. The biggest problem that employers have when they take on new recruits, whether they be age 16, whether they be after A-levels, perhaps as apprentices, when they be as graduate uh, entry level, is that they are often lacking what are called soft skills or employability skills. And we would uh, suggest that the teaching and learning of 3D technologies will actually bring a lot of these soft skills, these employability skills into focus and enable pupils to be far more employment ready when they leave school. I've already mentioned motivation, but motivation is probably the most important point. If you give children something which they find exciting, something which they find uh, motivating, then learning is not a problem. Motivate them and they will learn everything. And our experience is that in using our technologies specifically, but 3D technologies in general, it can be from other suppliers of course, 
does motivate them and therefore they learn and they learn fast and they have great fun whilst learning. And the last point which I've already mentioned, there is a 3D future in all sorts of different areas of everyday life and of technology which they will see and experience during their lifetimes. So coming back to teaching creative skills. What we see on this slide are top and left children, and we have had a child as young as three using this equipment, learning how to design in 3D. Most 3D designs in the world have been created using 3D CAD, computer-aided design. This is a, te a technology, a software, which was designed by engineers for engineers originally and is now used in, in engineering, in product design, in architecture and in some creative uh, fields such as jewellery. But it is not for all pupils. 3D CAD is used in the design and technology curriculum but it is often taught at Key Stage 4 and not before, and even then not all pupils get 3D design, or rather don't get 3D CAD. It is, it's complex, there are lots of drop-down lists, and it is something that you have to use frequently to remember what all the options are. For those who succeed with 3D CAD, it is a fantastic tool and gives them tremendous potential for design. But for those children who don't get it, who find it too difficult, or perhaps are too young to uh, be taught 3D CAD, or perhaps are doing other subjects and therefore never get the opportunity to find out about it, we have an alternative. And that alternative is being shown on the slide. If you look at the top right slide, you will see the girl holding a 3D mouse. So that is the mouse that is used, and the, the mouse drives a cursor around the screen, and the screen has a 3D virtual world. You can either import an existing file, or you can download shapes called primitives, so a sphere, a toroid, a cube, from a library of 3D shapes and then morph them, change them on the screen. There are very few uh, separate functions, so it is very quick to learn and very easy to use. What makes it particularly exciting is that it is hapticated and as a result it means that the children get force feedback on the mouse. What does this mean? Well, if the cursor touches a virtual object on the screen, you feel it as if it were a real object. You get force feedback, you get resistance from the object. So some people describe this as virtual clay modeling. You're using not just your visual sense, but also your kinesthetic sense in designing. And this force feedback is called haptics. And you're increasingly getting haptics on mobile phones when, for example, you get vibrations on certain functions. So this is a great way of learning to design. This is not the only route that can be chosen. We show another one, bottom right, which is using scanning. So if you have a physical object which exists in the real world, you can scan it either using a laser light, as is shown in the photograph, or you can use white light and create a, a 3D file, a virtual file of something which exists as a physical object, but not on a computer file. Once you've got that 3D file, you can then either make an exact copy of it by printing it or machining it. Alternatively, you can use it as the starting point for a new design and morph it and then print or machine or even export it into other 3D packages which would allow you to create, for example, animations. So you could use scanning to, for a pupil to scan their head, and once the head is scanned, you have then a computer file of their head. You can print a copy of their head, or they can use it to create an avatar and either print that avatar or take that into 
uh, another software package and have a virtual file of that avatar. There are other packages like Google SketchUp and um, Blender, which can also be used for designing in 3D. And what is required in each school is to decide what are the best packages to use, which fit best with what you're trying to achieve and what the pupils find easiest and most fun to use. Ultimately, this is about innovation and it's allowing children to explore their creativity and create a 3D design, which can then be turned into a physical model. A lot of people talk about STEM. I prefer STEAM. With STEAM, the extra A stands for arts or creativity, because creativity is just as much a part of learning STEM skills as science, as technology, as engineering and maths. And it is one of the, if you like, softer employability skills that all employers, whether they are in the uh, engineering or manufacturing sector or maybe they're in the banking sector or legal sector or hospitality whatever it may be these soft employability skills are valued by all employers here I mention some additional skills assembly maintenance machine operation and software and these are all part of the 3d printing process here because the 3d printer that we provide and some other suppliers provide comes in kit form. By assembling it themselves, the pupils learn how to assemble products, they learn maintenance skills by making it work, and they learn how to operate the machine. They can even learn software skills, programming skills, by learning about G-code, and that is the code that is used to actually program the machine, to make it run, to make it print. That equally applies to machining, because G-code is machine code for CNC or computer controlled machining as well as for 3D printing. Here are some other employability skills. We encourage pupils to work as teams, that they work on projects and that they then present their findings to their fellow pupils and to their teacher and explore their innovation and their creativity. And all of these are great skills for every employee. Design and technology, but. It is obvious that 3D design and 3D printing falls neatly into the curriculum for design and technology. But that's not the only area of the curriculum where it works. Children work and learn better if they have physical objects rather than just learning theoretically about their subject. So, if they're studying geography, as can be seen by the little uh, photograph on the right, if they had a terrain map, they would have a much better understanding of terrain rather than just looking at uh, a map. In the sciences, they could create an atomic structure or perhaps a map of the uh, solar system, or in biology, a double helix. And by creating these physical models of what they're learning, their learning becomes far more powerful and much more embedded. Art and design is another, another obvious area for the use of, of 3D printing. So I mentioned here uh, designing and making jewellery, but it could equally well be for other areas of art and design that this creativity and being able to create physical models works. 3D technologies are gender neutral. By that I mean they are just as effective, just as powerful, just as useful, just as exciting for girls as for boys. And they are also completely neutral in terms of what you want to design. So it could be an engineering piece such as this part, which is a model for a... This is an impeller, which is used in a turbocharger in a car. Equally, you could use the technology for designing and making 
a piece of jewellery like this bracelet. It is entirely up to the individual as to what they want to design and it works effectively no matter what the object and no matter what the geography. And this is, sorry, no matter, no matter what the object and no matter what the geometry. And what makes 3D printing particularly special is that because it is a technology which builds a part layer by layer, any geometry can be built, which is not necessarily true of CNC machining. So there is no such thing as a wrong design for 3D printing because anything can be printed. Finally, and going back to the question of across the school benefit, it doesn't matter what the subject is. If you're teaching Latin, for example, you could print Roman coins or a Roman shield or sword and the pupils would have a better idea of some of the uh, issues and some of the, the aspects of the subject that they're learning. So we see this not as a product which just falls within designer technology, but one which, like other IT products, interactive whiteboards or laptops, it should be used right across the school. Where does 3D printing come from? The first patents and the first machines for 3D printing came out in the late 1980s. At that time, the term 3D printing did not exist and it was called rapid prototyping. It was a technology that was designed to allow manufacturers to prototype the designs that would eventually become either a product or the parts of a product much more quickly and much more cost effectively than had been the case before. Prior to rapid prototyping, you would design a particular part and then if you wanted to see what it would look like in reality and if you wanted to test it before investing a lot of money in your final machine, you had to have tooling made. This was costly and time consuming. And by time consuming, I mean it could take weeks or months to produce the tooling. And imagine if you'd done that and spent thousands of pounds on the tooling and the part was wrong, you then have to go back to first principles. Rapid prototyping allowed a part to be, to be produced in a matter of hours, perhaps days, but at very low cost. And although the machines to produce these parts were expensive, the cost benefit for industry were huge. So over the next 20 years, more and more technologies came along which could produce prototyped parts in different materials and for different industries. They became more and more sophisticated and in the 2000s, instead of being called just rapid prototyping, you also started to hear the term rapid manufacture being used because some of the parts were so good they could actually be used in the final product. Where were they used? Well, they were used in engineering, in architecture and jewellery, and in other related areas. Machine cost was an issue. The range of materials was an issue. Every time a new type of 3D printing or rapid prototyping, let's call it by the proper name at that stage, was uh, developed, patents were taken out and if anybody else wanted to come into that field then they had to find a different way of doing it and they took out new patents. By, the, by around 2007-2008 the term that was used was additive fabrication but as patents ran out and the technology suddenly became accessible to more and more people, primarily due to cost, then we and other people started talking about 3D printing as being a terminology that would be rather more accessible to the general pu public than terms like additive manufacture or additive fabrication. So, 3D technologies now, well, still being used in engineering, in architecture, in fashion increasingly, shoes, chocolate, and in other areas. But what I will do is I will just give you a few examples of how 3D technologies, 3D printing, 
are used in some of these areas. So if we look at engineering now, here are, are just uh, a few examples and there are hundreds or probably thousands others that I could have chosen. You can see a respirator that was designed using 3D printing and prototyped so that it could be brought to market very much more cheaply and very much more quickly than might otherwise be the case. Talking about cases, the same applies to the Samsonite case on the right, which was also developed using 3D printing. The last shot at the bottom could be on this slide or it could be on a medical slide because this is a 3D printed prosthetic. One of the great advantages of 3D printing is that you can make a part which is specifically designed for, a, for an individual. Personalization. And if you're designing a prosthesis, then as each person's part of body is different, you want something that will fit them and not something which is just generic for anyone. So in the field of prosthetics, 3D printing has been a tremendous advantage, a fantastic benefit. Architecture. What we see here is a complete 3D printed map. The shot on the left shows you the harbour and the centre of Stockholm, the capital of Sweden. And on the right, you can see more detail taken from that very same map. And there are lots of other maps which have been made out of 3D printing. No self-respecting architecture firm would present a, um, a proposal to their customer without having made a model first. In the past, the models would have been made by hand and would have been very time consuming and very expensive. They could also be made using uh, 3D machining, but increasingly they are also being made using 3D printing. And it means that this technology is now accessible to every architectural firm. So not just the big players, but an individual architect working by himself instead of presenting his client with a, um, a 3D, sorry, not a 3D, an individual architect working on his own can now present his client with a 3D printed model of the house or perhaps area that they are going to see and they don't have to look at architectural drawings which on the whole are only understandable to architects. So the customers suddenly understand immediately what it is that they're being presented and it's great for the architect because it can be done at low cost and very quickly. Fashion. Now this is a very exciting and buzzy area of 3D technologies, of 3D printing now. Again, there are lots of designers, fashion designers, who are experimenting with 3D printing for fashion exploring it. And you can see at the top two designs by uh, a British designer called Catherine Wales. No relation as far as I'm aware. And here you can see some of the advantages of 3D printing in fashion terms. Firstly, it can be personalized. In other words, that it can be designed to fit perfectly the individual for whom it is being designed. Secondly, it can also be personalized in the sense that you can make one off and that that person who is buying that design could be the only person in the world to have it. Finally, because of the flexibility and the basic underlying technology of 3D printing, this building layer by layer to make a part, it means that you can design things which, and make them which were never possible before. And one can get some idea of that both from the Catherine Wales designs and also from Pierre Hintz's designs. Very unusual and 3D printing gives fashion designers the opportunity to explore directions that were never possible before. The next slide is also in the area of fashion, this time shoes. And here are some examples of 3D printed shoes. The photograph on the left is of a 
uh, fashion columnist for the Daily Mail trying on some 3D shoes. Again, we're at a very early stage in exploring what can be designed and what can be printed using 3D. I'm particularly fascinated by the 3D printed design at the bottom in the middle. This is really wacky, but that's the point, that people can explore creative ideas and as materials and printing processes improve, they will actually be able to make them comfortable and wearable as well. Chocolate. For some reason, when we go into schools and talk about 3D printing and mention 3D printing of chocolate to pupils, this seems to motivate them like no other area. We're not quite sure why, but we're, we're working on it. There is a 3D chocolate printer which has been produced by the University of Exeter and which allows you to design any shape and then print out that shape in chocolate. Their target market is the chocolatier. So you can go into a chocolate shop and say, I don't know, it's my 16th birthday and I want to have a chocolate present for everybody who comes and I want it to be their name printed out in chocolate. So here's another great example of personalization that at no extra cost, each person going to that party could have their name printed in chocolate. So those are some of the areas in which 3D printing is being used at the moment. Some of them are far more developed than others, but now we're going to go and explore some of those which are perhaps slightly further in the future and which are going to be really exciting and are certainly motivating to every teacher and to every pupil that I've spoken to. I talked about personalization. And the way that future 3D printing is going is that it will allow what is called mass customization of products. In other words, that you can make each product different for each individual, but you can produce lots of them. 3D printing is not, at least in the short term, going to replace other manufacturing technologies because it is much slower and uh, is much more uh, both time and machine uh, dependent than other manufacturing technologies, but what it does allow you to do is to make them differently. Maybe in the future 3D printing will also be a mass production technique, but we haven't seen that yet. So of those that are mentioned on this slide, let's first of all turn to medicine, which is perhaps one of the most dramatic, most exciting, and in some ways perhaps the most worrying technologies for the future. I've given just a few examples here and again as with all of the examples I give there are many others that I could have shown. At the top you can see a 3D skull with a person who had damage to their skull and in order to repair it a plate was needed which could be put in place. This is a, a model in which the plate was first of all prepared. So you take a skull, you, sc oh, take, you take a person's head, you scan their head and create a model skull, a 3D printed skull. And then you can take an inverse model of the whole and create the shape of the plate that will fit it. What this means is that the surgeons can see very clearly what they're going to have to do when it comes to surgery. But it also means that you can 3D print a titanium plate which fits in exactly correctly into that person's skull. Bottom left, and you can see somebody with a deformed ear and a 3D printed ear prior to being painted and prepared so that it can replace the ear that that person had in the, from birth and the 3D printed ear will probably be pretty unnoticeable to people unless they actually knew that it was a 3D printer here. The final photograph shows a piece of 3D printed skin. Now here is where it gets really interesting. That piece of 3D printed skin was taken from someone's stem cells 
and then a bioplotter or a 3D printer for biological material printed a piece of skin. So if you imagine that person had a, um, a burn and needed to have some skin replacement to cover up the scars, instead of having an operation to remove some skin from another part of the body, usually the back of the thigh, which when it is grafted onto the area needing the graft, looks different colour and has to be cut into shape by the surgeon. And of course, you've had two operations. In future, you'll be able to print a graft of that person's skin using their stem cells. So it's their skin, there's no rejection, and it can be printed to be exactly the right size, shape, colour, and so on. If you can do that with skin, in the future, and I don't think we're looking that far ahead, you'll be able to do that with other human organs, kidneys, livers, perhaps even hearts, and further afield, perhaps even brains. And when it gets to the brains bit, then it gets a bit scary. But in terms of the benefit that 3D medicine in the future will be able to bring, this is absolutely extraordinary and it will change the field of medicine so that perhaps in the future there will be no need for vivisection, no need for testing on animals. You can test on pieces of human uh, organ which are not attached to a person but which allow you to test the, the viability of certain medicines. So this is going to change medicine in all sorts of different ways. And the tests and the experimentation is being done now. Rather different, how about house building? So instead of having a, a small 3D printer to print uh, a small model like the ones I showed you, or how about a 3D printed Dalek, you can start to print really big objects. So if you look at the photographs, the uh, the machine top left actually exists. It's a, a prototype machine which is exploring the possibility of 3D printing a complete building in one go. To the right you see a, a model, and a, a, an example of how it might look. And the rather difficult to see picture bottom left, which is an example of the sort of slightly crazy structure that architects might consider in the future because of the way the 3D printing works, it allows them to produce just about anything. But if you could imagine a lorry, a low loader, carrying a large machine, goes into an area, perhaps in a third world country, where they are very short of housing, and using local materials, local sand and water, make up cement, and build up walls and conduits and roofs and a whole 3D house, very low cost and in a very short while, this could revolutionize 3D, well, we could revolutionize house building by the use of 3D printing. Food. You have a 3D printed icing building on the left. You have a 3D printed, it looks to me like a beef burger on the right. And we've got something now coming up on the screen, so I don't know whether something is going to show or not. I can edit this out, it's fine. Top right, you have what looks like a 3D printed beef burger. I don't know whether it's edible, but it just shows you the sort of crazy things that can be done. It looks quite fun. And bottom left, you have a design of something called the cornucopia, designed at MIT in the States. And the idea there is to design a machine, this is just a, a, an early stage mock-up, where you can mix different uh, constituents and bring them together and make different types of food. 3D printing in space. Now NASA are sponsoring a number of projects 
including one where they are looking to see whether you can 3D print pizzas in space. Another one is just trying to improve the quality of food that astronauts have in space because usually they eat uh, paste or powder, which no matter what the food is, it all tastes the same. So NASA are exploring whether it is possible to improve the, uh, the type of uh, cuisine that they can have in space. You can see an example of a, a 3D printer in a, uh, I'm not sure whether that is in space, I think maybe it's just in a low gravity environment, but the idea is that if you take a 3D printer into space, and this is now serious stuff, that you can start to make things there rather than to have to transport them from Earth. And it is very expensive to get any object from Earth up into uh, space up into orbit. So if you can make it out there, rather than to transport it there, it becomes very cost effective. Also, imagine if you are an astronaut on the Moon or on Mars and you want to make things. If you had a 3D printer which could make everything once you got there, you wouldn't need to have to carry very much with you at all. And that's what the model at the top right is all about this 3D positionable micro dispensing system. In principle, the idea is that you can put anything, any material into it at all, and it'll produce whatever it is that you need. So those of you who watch Star Trek will have some, some idea that this has already been done in the past, and that anything that science comes up with, science fiction writers have thought of before. But if this can be done, and here again, we're at a very early stage, I'm sure it can be done, but it may take quite a while to get there. This will have an immense impact on space travel in the future. 3D technologies at home. Will it happen? Yes, it certainly will. And it's already happening in the sense that a lot of 3D printers have been supplied into people's homes where the person is a, a techie, an engineer who wants to explore 3D printing and play with it. But for 3D printing to be in any home, then what you need is a what is called a killer app, the application that will drive that particular need. Is there going to be one? Well, I think there will. And I think what it's going to be is kids designing their own environment, their own toys, their own games. It's going to happen soon, but for that to happen, what, what is needed is for the technology to become lower cost, easier to use, more reliable, and for there to be easy to use software that children feel comfortable about using at home. But with the new generation of children being brought up on all sorts of electronic devices, I think that they're going to find this actually very easy. What I suspect is going to happen is that in a few years' time, kids are going to start to have 3D printers at home and parents are going to ask them to produce some things for themselves. So it will be exactly the same as we have now, where in most households there is a, um, a video recorder and when the parents want to record something, they'll say to their six-year-old, can you set the video recorder up for me, please, because I want to watch such and such a program. And the six-year-old knows how to do it, even if his parents don't. So I've just shown bug droids as an example of the sort of thing that perhaps children might like to print at home. On the other side is a, um, a competition that Shapeways, which is an online uh, 3D print company, did, was they asked a number of designers to come up with new shapes for a coffee cup. And on the photograph, you can see some of the designs that people came up with. So, for example, there's one that is shaped a bit like a watering can. Uh, one that I rather like, which is sort of in the middle of the picture, slightly to the, uh, the northeast of centre. If you want to have half a cup of coffee, why not start with a half coffee cup? There's one bottom right, presumably by a French designer, which shows the Eiffel Tower sitting inside the coffee cup makes drinking coffee a bit different, a bit difficult, but uh, even if it's not possible to drink from it, 
Well, that's part of the fun of 3D printing. And finally, this is my favourite, top right, and you can't clearly see it, but the handle has been 3D printed on the inside of the coffee cup rather than on the outside. I don't recommend trying to hold the handle when you've got a hot cup of coffee, but I think it's a lovely idea. So, the future is all about children's imagination, about children's design. And whatever they can imagine, it can be designed. And whatever is designed, it can be printed. Thank you.